in a nutshell, Kyle, if you can just tell our viewers and listeners here, what is a 1031 exchange? Yeah, if you own investment real estate or any property that is used for investment, you can sell that property and use all of the proceeds to purchase another property used for investment without and deferring the tax liability from that sale. Um, lots of confusion as to what investment refers to and it simply refers to the use of the property rather than the type. If you own a strip mall, you can sell that and purchase on the other side of the exchange, maybe a multi-family property, three or four units or even 10 units. You can sell industrial warehouse and purchase um, interest in a securitized vehicle that qualifies for a 1031 exchange. Again, it simply comes down to using as much of the proceeds uh, to purchase other property for investment. And it does not need to be one property for one property, Rob. You can sell one and buy two. You can sell two and buy one. It really doesn't matter. Okay, okay. So if somebody's going to sell, let's say, a two family property that they had rented out, and they're going to turn around and they're going to buy a single family investment property that would still qualify, correct? It certainly would, as long as it is continued to be used for investment purposes. Okay, okay, so that makes sense. Can you give uh, maybe an example of one that you've worked on that, I don't know, maybe it wasn't as clear cut, because I think, you know, from what you're saying, it makes sense, it sounds straightforward, but in what circumstances maybe is it not as straightforward or you need to get a little bit more intricate? Well, uh, not necessarily intricate, but some the ways some investors have used the strategy. Maybe there's someone here in the Northeast who owns property and investment property and is looking to retire down in a warmer climate in a few years, let's say Florida. So maybe they own the investment property in Connecticut or Massachusetts. They sell that property, that investment property today. Per through an exchange, they purchase another investment property down in Florida and they use it as an investment for a few years until they retire and then that becomes their second house they convert the use that is allowed there are certain guidelines that need to be met but if it's used as an investment or uh, when it's purchased it can be converted it often can be converted at a later date for personal use um, there might be an individual who's structuring an estate plan and maybe they have three children, but a, own a duplex as an investment property. Usually that doesn't end up very well because maybe one child wants to live in the property, one wants to own it, and one wants to sell it. How will they decide? Well, maybe through a 1031 exchange, they purchase three individual properties, one earmarked for each one of the children or each of the heirs. Maybe someone owns a property in Boston and Boston has seen a great appreciation in price over the past decade. There's not maybe not as much upside remaining in Boston. They can purchase a property in a different market that has greater upside. Or maybe they've owned that property for the residential property for 27 and a half years and have fully depreciated it. So they cannot offset any more of that income that is uh, income paid from that property. So they might conduct an exchange and buy a larger property. Um, this is just one slide we often discuss as to why someone would sell through an exchange. There are plenty of other reasons and conversations, but certainly capital gains tax deferral is one. It's not the only reason for it. Um, maybe it's you know preservation of capital, the estate planning, want to diversify their investment portfolio into other asset classes or property types or locations, um, or even increase that cash flow. I think it is important to note that anyone conducting a 1031 exchange can buy property anywhere within the United States. It is, okay. a, it is okay. within the federal tax code. So as long as yeah, property so it sounds pretty yeah. flexible. I mean, overall, as long as you're going from one, the same property type, it's pretty flexible. Can you give maybe uh, an example of 
a downside to doing a 1031 exchange or a, a negative on why you wouldn't want to do a 1031 exchange. I mean, obviously, if you're trading in an investment property to buy a primary home, I, I can see that that wouldn't work as a 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. Or if you're selling a, your primary home to buy an investment property, maybe that wouldn't work. But can you talk about a scenario where there would be a negative connotation of it associated with Certainly, Rob, and this is coming up more and more every day, the conversation of what's going to happen with tax rates in the future. A lot of individuals and media reports are saying tax rates are only going to go up. A lot of it could lie on the election three months from now, what the outcome is, but it could also just rely on the printing press that uh, has been coming out of Washington and what will happen with the federal budget. So that is caution a lot of individuals provide. Now, there are two sides of the coin here. Yes, rates could go up in the future. So how about I sell, pay my taxes on a lower rate today rather than exchange and then have a higher rate in the future? The answer to that is you can continue to exchange throughout your life and upon your death, the tax liability is erased. Your heirs receive the property, it's what's called a stepped up value. So if you sell a property today for 100,000 and purchase one for 100,000, and then two years from now it's worth 200,000, or a few years from now it's worth 200,000. And then sell that, buy another one. A few years later, maybe that's worth 400,000. Each time your capital gains uh, your, your gains will be increasing. Well, your heirs might eventually receive that at the stepped up value, which means they would receive it at that $400,000 mark and not be liable for the deferred gains. So it's, it will be free and clear for them. So it really is a massive wealth generation tool. It seems That's like the this scenario where if somebody is a real estate investor and they're not using something like this, they're missing the boat. I mean, this is one of the main tax strategies used by real estate investors. I know every big real estate investor I know uses 1031 exchanges all the time. They're just growing that value, growing that nut bigger and bigger. Uh, and, you know, like you said, taxes can be paid upon death or don't need to be paid upon death. So that's a huge advantage, you know, to using this. So I think if you're somebody watching or listening and you're either already a real estate investor or you're getting into real estate investment, this really needs to be the cornerstone of your tax strategy. Would you agree? It is something that definitely needs to be considered. Um, it has been around for nearly a hundred years. And so it's nothing new. Unfortunately, there's no hard concrete data as to how many exchanges happen every day or what price point they are. But as long as the property is used for investment, individuals are conducting 1031 exchanges. It is important to note, the exchange needs to be in place before you sell the property. Okay. If you sell the property and the money goes right from the closing table to your bank account, it's taxable. So, so this is going to be something that needs to be planned ahead for. You need to consult with your uh, financial advisor, tax advisor, CPA. You know, those type of individuals will need to be involved in drawing the correct paperwork up, making sure that the transaction happens in the correct order, in the correct way, in order to actually do this the right way so you don't end up getting hit at the end with a bunch of taxes that you thought you wouldn't have if it's done incorrectly. Yeah, correct, Rob. And I think when it comes down to your financial advisor and tax preparer or accountant or tax advisor or lawyer, yes, they will help review if it is a suitable strategy for you. You need a, an independent party involved in the process called a qualified intermediary. Usually 30 days, 60 days out is plenty of time for a qualified intermediary to work with you in creating that exchange. And is the qualified intermediary going to be somebody that is a financial advisor or what type of person would be the intermediary? Yeah, it depends on the state. Um, it is 
only regulated in a few states. Uh, they do need to be licensed in Connecticut to act as a qualified intermediary. There are exemptions that do uh, prevent them from registering with the state. Um, it's an independent third person who you have not had a direct business relationship with. There are plenty of individuals who operate exclusively as a qualified intermediary. Your okay. financial advisor, your accountant cannot be your qualified intermediary. Okay. Hopefully they can help direct you to one that they know. If not, Excellent. I always, there are a few I work with as well. Yeah, so you'll want to consult with them to get that taken care of, to get that intermediary lined up, so to speak. Like Kyle said, 30 to 60 days before the closing of the transaction should be plenty of time. Um, I would recommend as soon as the your property goes under contract, I would recommend that you get all these in, things in play. This isn't something you want to be dealing with at the 11th hour. Yeah, and, and Rob, uh, I would even say before you go under contract, simply because you don't want to have to go back and amend all the documents. You'll need a couple of statements within the PNS. Okay, okay, that makes sense. All right, well, we've uh, given you guys kind of that overview on 1031 exchanges, so I want to switch gears here now and move